Hi everyone, Boomer here and welcome back to the channel for not only a channel update but this video is going to serve two purposes. The first is to say goodbye to our great friend here, the Rainmaker. This will be the last video for a while I suppose uh, involving the Rainmaker. She is going to be replaced uh, from the end of this video onwards but she did leave us with a bit of a parting gift and that parting gift would be the highest DPS pass that I've ever had which considering that I haven't played the game for three years that I am quite happy with that is kind of last thing so if you watch for the um, Borg STF at the end of this um, you will see the highest pass that I have made with this ship it was Again, nothing spectacular. It's around about 42, 43,000 uh, DPS. So, you know, nothing, nothing spectacular, but uh, I was fairly happy to be doing that in a pug. Anyway, that's not necessarily the overall theme of this video. And I will be most certainly probably not referring much to what's going on on the screen for the remainder of this video, maybe except towards the end. But the idea is to really get into, number one, a uh, my thoughts on the recent uh, Star Trek Picard series. Um, it's been out for, I think it's finished for about a week now, so I had time to certainly digest it, had time to come up with some thoughts on it. And the second part of this video is going to be taken up with how I intend to uh, take the channel forward. So, my overall thoughts on the Picard series then. I think that there are certainly positives that have come from it, but I think there are also negatives as well. One of the questions that I have to ask myself when it comes to a Trek series, you've got to realise that if you're making a brand new Trek series, you're already up against it. The uh, reason for that being is that the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager, the big four, were made in a very different time in terms of the entertainment industry. Uh, to give you some example, I am from the UK, and when Star Trek The Next Generation, which is what I grew up with, was uh, first released, or first even available in the UK, uh, there were a total of four terrestrial television channels. There was no such thing as the internet, or at least it was very much in its infancy, um, I think the phrase at the time that the internet of that period was 90% porn and 10% Star Trek and that was pretty much all you could get and we were in the period where if you wanted to download say for example the first contact uh, intro music that was going to take you a significant amount of time. So we certainly weren't in the days that we are now of instant gratification and instant media all the time and due to that I'm not sure how fair it is to be able to pull comparisons between the two because in that time the idea of an episodic series going for 26 episodes a year for seven years in the case of Deep Space Nine Voyager and The Next Generation was something that was just basic standard TV fare. There were several other, uh, several other series that went on like that at the same time. However, that just simply isn't the case these days. And whether it's a generational thing or whether it's a just simply a. Uh, fact of the time is that everything these days seems to very much be around grabbing people's attention and not necessarily building stuff up for big payoffs. There are of course some uh, there are of course some exceptions to that rule, but the vast majority of television and 
streaming etc that is produced these days is very much around getting someone's attention very quickly and not necessarily bedding in for the long run and you're seeing that seasons of uh, series are much shorter, they tend to have much higher production values, and they tend to be a lot more shocking as well. And due to that, there's not so much in the way of story building that can happen. And there's not so much in the way of one-off episodes that you can explore. I mean, when you look at The Next Generation, especially, is a very good example of this, while there were a couple of overarching themes, there weren't any real periods, say for half a season or so, where you focused on simply one storyline. It kind of batted back and forward between various different storylines. And because of that, um, the series felt very varied and certain story it allowed them to explore a lot more and therefore, they weren't sort of stuck if they had either a bad overarching storyline or a villain that didn't work or something along those lines. It allowed them to move on to another one. Um, so you ended up with episodes like Chain of Command in The Next Generation, which is an absolutely incredible uh, episode of The Next Generation, but we never saw Gul Madred again. And because of that, it left, it left you with a, uh, you know, it left you with a very, very fulfilled, you felt fulfilled by it, but you didn't feel like it was overexposed either. You knew that the Cardassians were this, uh, it gave you the introduction to the Cardassians, how ruthless of the people they were. David Warner obviously knocking it out of the park because that's generally what he does when he's on set. But, um, again, it wasn't overexposed. And, it wasn't something where, if someone, if it was a character that people didn't want to, well, it didn't really matter. It was one episode out of 26. I'm sure you're going to come up with something else. But nowadays, when you look at Star Trek Discovery and you look at Star Trek, um, when you look at Star Trek Picard, and even to a lesser extent, Enterprise, um, Enterprise very much had an ongoing arc with the Temporal Cold War. Uh, however, the unfortunate thing I think about Star Trek uh, Enterprise was very much it was in that era where things were beginning to change and it was really kind of like The Next Generation didn't really find its footing until the third season. People stuck with The Next Generation. The first two seasons of TNG aside from a couple of episodes like Measure of a Man, they really weren't um, they really weren't great episode it wasn't a great series and even the tng actors will admit that it was the third season when they started finding their footing and to be honest with enterprise a lot of people who have reviewed it and i agree with them to a certain part is that it actually was a series that got cut off at the point where it started becoming decent um or at least it started becoming something that people might wanted to have watched. And that's just really, you know, it was really unfortunate that that's what happened. But nowadays, we're in this full effect where you have Discovery, you have the Klingon War in the first series, you have another overarching story for the second series, in Picard you've got one story for the whole thing and if people don't warm to the characters that are there so for example I can understand what they've done in the first few episodes and the way I was looking at it was okay the idea is I'd known that season two had been greenlit so what they were looking to do was establish your heroic characters this wasn't going to be the next generation it was going to be a different version of Picard I was absolutely fine with this. The Next Generation, just bringing back the Next Generation crew and cast would probably just rip... I would say it would have been in overindulgent, to tell you the truth. It would have just been... Uh, it would have just been a nostalgia trip and that's pretty much all we would have had. And admittedly, they brought some of them back. They brought some of the characters back. And it was fantastic seeing... Um, Marina Sirtis and Jonathan Frakes again. I really 
that was an episode I really enjoyed. And it was the least crash bangy. It was the slowest paced episode on the uh, whole. Yeah, it was the slowest paced episode of the whole arc, I thought. But it was one that I genuinely enjoyed because you could see the bond between those characters. And it's something that we know that was forged over seven years of a series and four feature movies you're not going to get that with characters that you have only just introduced and i think that it's definitely something where in these days i think that we have to realize that things are going to be fast paced because they literally have to be if you don't grab people's attention your series isn't lasting another series so you have to grab attention where, and you're not going to be given that chance that maybe the first few series of Star Trek were given that chance because in reality there wasn't much else that people were going to be tuning into whereas nowadays everything is designed to grab your attention be it from you know adverts or YouTube channels you know there's so many like, things like drama YouTube channels etc it's all designed to grab your attention and a lot of it can just be incredibly gratuitous and I think that in some cases many people got the wrong end of the stick with a lot of the complaints in there and I want to approach one especially which was my biggest sort of complaint because I thought that I thought that the one that they really got wrong and one episode which almost made me turn off the entire series was the fifth episode where they introduced Seven and Nine with Star, uh, Star the City Ride. As someone who'd grown up with Voyager, and to be honest, the character of Seven probably saved Voyager as a series. Um, they recognised the, you know, they recognised something needed to be done with one of the characters. They brought in Jerry Ryan. Um, obviously, she was something that was going to appeal to the male fans, but to give. Uh, to give Jerry Ryan her absolute due on this and to give the writers of Voyager their uh, deserved due as well on this they made Seven one of the most compelling characters that there's ever been on Star Trek between her and the Hollow Dark, those two characters really for me they were the primary characters who I invested in in, uh, in Star Trek Voyager uh, with Janeway and Janeway's character definitely also being up there because she definitely gets uh, areas in the series where she's struggling. Uh, you see sort of almost her going through uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, survivor guilt, all the things that uh, can potentially happen. So when she's made the decision she had and she's been put in the situation she is. Now, I do want to... Explore and I'll go into Stardust City Rack in a minute, but I want to discuss one of the things where people, some people have just said, oh, it's overly dark. Well, it's not that Star Trek has ever been in, a, Star Trek, it's not that Star Trek has never been afraid to explore dark things in the past. You know, there have been some very dark episodes of Star Trek. If you look at uh, if you look at areas such as, or episodes such as in the Pale Moonlight, when they brought in Section 31, for example, in Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine was probably the series that really turned the corner on the fact that we're going to be, we are going to be fine going forward exploring the darker aspects. And one of the things that, and it's certainly come true, look into the real world. Look at the real world where we are now, where the coronavirus is hitting. And... Some people out there are taking, you know, they're not thinking of the whole, they are thinking of themselves, you know, when people are going out and when they're, you know, they're doing things that in necessity they probably shouldn't do, uh, they're hoarding for things, things like that. And one of the things that makes that, and one of the things that I would have liked to have seen more on Star Trek, because very often we got the uh, we got the preachy sort of uh, you know humanity is better than it was and the idea is that humanity has become better but let's explore this from a 21st century point of view when you compare humanity now in the 21st century to how we were in say the 18th century are we hugely better than we used to be or have we just got better technology and a better understanding of what's going on around us have we actually 
introduced, has humanity itself changed or is it just our knowledge and our technology has changed? And that's something that Star Trek has made a habit of exploring and sometimes it can get exceedingly dark and that's fine. Also, when it comes down to the, when it comes down to the gore that was in, and I'm going to come back to Stardust City Rag here because this really bothered me. Star Trek hasn't had a problem with gore in the past. It's done things. It has had gore in it. I mean, let's take, for example, you know, First Contact. For, for You've got the sequence with Picard at the beginning of it. You've got some fairly gratuitous shots of the Borg assimilating the Starfleet officers on the Enterprise. And the less said about what happened to this guy, probably better. Um, and that was in the very first series of The Next Generation. And let's not take into account the other horrific things we've been subjected to throughout the history of Star Trek. But what bothered me about Stardust City Rag is that wasn't gore for the sake of just literally shocking someone or showing... You could have shown why Seven of Nine had had character changes without going into gratuitous horror flick gore like that. There was no need to do something like that. And Star Trek was never about that. And there was no need to do that in order to establish character motivation. Because let's face it, spoiler alert, Seven kills the character responsible for it at the end of the episode. And, you know, gains very little from it. And at the end of it, Seven just basically becomes the token badass female of the... Uh, token badass female of the franchise which to be honest that's not really that was never Seven's point Seven was always incredibly capable she was always very you know she could hand, she could obviously handle herself in a fight she's an ex-Borg but it was never the primary focus of her character to be this badass and you know, now she's got, you know, now she's got all these problems. She's got, like, drink, you know, what looks to be a drinking problem being put in because, obviously, all flawed characters have to have a drinking problem of some sort. And, to me, it's just cliched and it doesn't add anything to this character who I think that a lot of us grew up with. In terms of the other things that we see on the show, and to be honest, as I said, I was very close after that episode to just giving up on the series because that wasn't what I as a fan wanted to wanted to see but I decided to stick with it and the next episode after it it began to move the plot on so there was enough there just to keep me in and I suppose that's the job that they're supposed to be doing keep you in keep you engaged keep you watching okay I didn't feel like it was necessary to kill Hugh either. And I feel like as much as Game of Thrones... I'm going to ignore the last season of Game of Thrones. But Game of Thrones basically set absolute... Uh, it set absolute standards for how things were going to go. The shock value, the fact that you know main characters could just be killed off and you wouldn't expect it. Things would happen. It made you tune in. But now I feel like it's almost become a trope. And, you know, we're going to subvert expectations because that's what people want. Well, if people are expecting you now to do that, it's just become a trope. It's just got no value. Things only work where, things only work as subversions of expectations when they make sense. And they also fit within the framework of what you are trying to accomplish. And in this circumstance, I don't believe that the writers managed to do that. But, ultimately, we ended up at the final episode of the series. Or the final couple of episodes of the series. And... I would say that I did enjoy the series as it begun wrapping up. I felt like certain things were very copy-pasted. I felt like... But I felt like it became more like Star Trek. Um, to be honest, I was almost cringing when the massive Federation fleet appears in the final episode because I was just thinking, is this now what Star Trek is? It's like, is Trek just yet another science fiction show where humanity's in the future, there's various 
races that we don't like for whatever reason and we have a massive space punch up with a load of effects and in reality it's all going to be forgotten within four or five years and that's the big question you've got to ask of DC especially when you're dealing with a title like Star Trek or Star Wars or something like that is this going to be remembered in five years 10 years 20 years and regarding this season I would have to say it it isn't but one thing that did make me happy was that it was resolved in a very Trek way was it a bit of a uh, quick way? Well, yes, but that's, again, because of the structure that we find ourselves in. Long, convoluted explanations to things aren't really where, uh, aren't really where TV goes these days. And for that matter, that might be why, in a way, without wishing to be too harsh, it might be a good time to let Trek, uh, it might be a good time to let Trek go in that sort of format because I don't think you're going to get buy-in in, uh, for that sort of series. I may be wrong. People might be crying out for that. We may be at the point where, you know, we've been there. I want and I want this now, 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 now. And maybe there is room for something a bit more, uh, a bit more long-term, but we shall definitely have to see about that. But one thing that came to my mind as I was thinking about doing this episode and thinking about this was okay this got solved in the Star Trek way but is there anything I can compare this to because there isn't really and then I did think let's look back a little bit onto my channel and let's just look at a game for example let's look at Star Trek A Final Unity funnily enough it has a couple of similar things it has the whole overriding doomsday plot that this series does it also has the uh, it also has the Romulans doing stuff they shouldn't do. Uh, it has combat, but and it has the very Trekish resolution. But if you're asking me which one I, as a Star Trek fan, would prefer to watch, i.e., you put uh, you put a Final Unity into some kind of film style format for a ten se for a ten episode season format or Star Trek Picard, I personally would want to watch the final Unity. Um, now that, again, maybe just due to my nostalgia and due to what I think that uh, Picard should be, uh, and obviously it's probably not a fair test because we're dealing with completely different characters, you know, it's a completely different character arc and everything like that, but I feel that in terms of capturing Star Trek, obviously a file unity was made again in those times of uh, where Star Trek was following the dedicated formula. It had a very Star Trek style ending, it had a very Star Trek style feel to it. And that was the sort of thing I feel like maybe they could have made work in a 10 episode format. They could obviously have changed it. They could have brought it up to date. They could have had different character motivations. They could have used a different crew. That would, it would have been certainly possible to do something like that. But instead, it very much became a, uh, it became what we ended up with. And, uh, I'm not going to be vastly over negative about it, but I would say that they are they take a risk moving back onto the overarching plot line for ten episodes, you take a risk with that because the only way I can see to doing things like that would be very similar to how either DS9 handled the Dominion War or Babylon 5 handled the uh, handled the Shadow War, the Volon conflict everything like that if you're going to have this overriding story just have it there it's something in the background you can come into it and this is the problem with 10 episode series if you have a 26 episode series or 20 episode series you only need to come onto the main overriding story three or four times everything else can be character building it can be uh, you know, it can be something different. You can introduce new characters, and if they work, bring those characters back, but don't overexpose them. Just bring them back for another episode or two. 
I think Shran worked quite well like that in Enterprise. He wasn't around all the time, but he got brought back. And, you know, the same thing would be true with certain characters in Babylon 5. Morden wasn't around for every episode, but he was fairly, he was fairly popular. And these are the sort of things that you've got to think about when making these series, but because they've literally just said, here are the eight characters or ten characters I think it will end up, here's the characters we're going to be dealing with for the next ten episodes, they're all like well, I don't really like sort of four or five of them, you're gonna instantly feel like you're out of the entire series and it's a big risk, but Overall, I would say certain things were well handled in this. I like the fact, even though I would have liked to have seen a big battle just for the big child in me, I like the fact it was resolved in a Trek-style way. There was no sort of... There was a kind of Deus Ex Machina, but it was a very Star Trek side one. I absolutely adore the way they brought Data's arc to a close. I feel like... Now, a lot of Trek fans had a very, very sour taste in their mouth after Nemesis. They really felt like his death was poorly handled. I felt like it was absolutely... I felt that this ending paid the character a massive amount of respect. I felt like it was emotional and it was well played by all involved. Great to see Brent Spiner back. Absolutely fine. And... I also feel like it's kind of, in a way, they've wrapped it up ready for them to go off into something new. Rather than going, the first season was very much kind of, okay, we've, you know these characters, but it's a different setting, it's a different world. And we have to establish that world, but what they've done, or what I hope they've done, is they've got Picard back to, not necessarily what he used to be, but they've got him back to a more dominant well, not dominant, but a more um, more of the character that we remember, taking charge, etc. And yes, there were occasions where we're like, he's being bullied just by all the women on the show. No, he was being bullied by everybody, let's just face it. Because they had to establish, or they felt they had to establish the narrative that he was old, worn out, lost faith, and uh, he was pretty much waiting to die. And at the end of it, he's found that new lease on life, and he's got a new crew, so... We will see how that goes, and hopefully they can just sort out some of the flaws with it, but I will certainly give Season 2 a chance. So, that's my thoughts on Starship Picard. If anyone wants me to go deeper into individual episodes, I'm happy to do so. In terms of how the channel is going to go in the future, I'm going to be using Star Trek Online, as you see here, as very much a stopgap. There's loads of content I haven't explored yet, and... Um, I will definitely be going down that line. But I think that what's going to be up next is uh, going back to Bullfrog Games. I'm going to do either Theme Hospital or Dungeon Keeper 2, I believe. However, I suppose that's uh, fairly appropriate with the time. However, I will continue with my Star Trek. Uh, my Star Trek ways as well and I'll lean, leave you with a couple of beauty shots of the Rainmaker as she makes her final voyage for now and thank you very much guys for watching I look forward to hearing back from you and I will see you next time take care everyone